Welcome back. I uh, hope you guys had a good lunch and a few good breakout sessions. And now we start the fun part of the day, uh, our Champions of Change event. Uh, and to start us off uh, for today, we have the Assistant to the President and Senior Advisor, Valerie Jarrett. Well, good afternoon, everyone. We are just delighted to have each and every one of you here on behalf of President Obama, welcome to the White House, your house. I'd like to begin by recognizing Betsy Lander, President of the PTA. Betsy, stand up so everybody can give you a proper <laughs> shout out. We want to thank you for everything you do for the PTA and also all the help you and your team put together to help us organize this tremendous event. I'm thrilled to see that it's all the way to the back row. We filled the room with everyone and we're just delighted you're here and we hope you've enjoyed the day. I know it's been action packed. I couldn't believe the 16 different breakout groups that we had during lunch, but something for everybody and I hope that you, you have found it to be a rewarding day. And I also want to say greetings to everybody who's been watching online. Uh, you can join our conversation online or, or on Twitter with the hashtag WHPTA. I recently joined Twitter, so I'm learning all the lingo. Uh, my handle, I heard it's called a handle, is at VJ44. And so I encourage anyone who's here, please tweet out. The folks are so proud back home to have you here, and we want to join in that celebration. And one of the ways of doing that, of course, is over the social media. So as I said, I know you've been here since early morning, but now we're ready for what I truly believe is the highlight of the day. It's time to honor those 12 very, very special representatives from your group who have made a huge impact in your communities back home. Nearly every week here at the White House, we, ordinate, we honor ordinary Americans who are doing extraordinary things in their communities all across the country. And we call them, as you've heard, champions of change. Very simple and to the point. And I am especially excited about the honorees that we have here this week. We are honoring 12 PTA champions of change who are improving their schools and the lives of so many young people across the country. As leaders, advocates, motivators, and volunteers, they work to do for children in their communities nothing short of miracles every day, heroic work. And so please join me in giving a round of applause to our 12 champions of change. As parents, the President and the First Lady know how important it is for parents to be engaged in their children's lives and involved in their schools. They know that they have the ability to make a difference not only in their own children's lives, but in the, create, in the health and vitality of an entire community. I'll give you just one example. Earlier this week, Cynthia Germanata, who's Lady Gaga's mom, and I, I know it's hard to believe I have anything to do with Lady Gaga, but her mom and I are the same age, and actually Lady Gaga is the same age as my daughter. We got together and participated in the Department of Education's third annual Bullying Prevention Summit. Our goal is simple, ending bullying in our schools. The PTA is an essential partner in that effort, for no child or family should have to endure the pain and agony that can be associated with bullying. My own mom is a, is a devoted um, lifelong teacher herself. First, she was a preschool teacher, and then she co-founded and later became president of Erickson Institute, which is a graduate school in early childhood development, where to this day, at the age of 83, she is still teaching. She taught me at an early age the value of parents being involved in their children's education. And I've tried to instill those same values in my daughter, who is all grown up now, 26. That's why here at the White House, we are so excited to honor these champions of change and to recognize and lift up all PTA members all across our country for the vital work that you all do each and every day. To each one of you, our champions, our 12 champions of change, all the PTA leaders who are here today, all of those of you who are watching online, and every single parent across our country who puts time and effort into their children's education, each and every one of you are heroes. Your work and involvement is the key to making our children thrive 
in their schools and in their communities. And on behalf of the president, I want to just thank you all for everything that you do each and every day. And now, to tell you a little bit more about every one of our 12 champions, I'd like to introduce to you a person who I have known for a very long time. We're not going to talk about how many years. Everybody always jokes about, you see she was holding her breath. She's like, don't tell them. Everybody always jokes about the president's gray hair. Well, our gray hair is not so funny as his gray hair tends to be. But we go back a long time. I'm just delighted that she's here in the, oh, a little angel. <laughs> a little darling. That actually is a good thing. We want to have children a part of this so that they can appreciate what you all do as well. Back to my friend Tina. Uh, Tina is not only the First Lady's Chief of Staff, but she also is the Executive Director of the White House Council on Women and Girls. Uh, and I have the pleasure of chairing the council. And so we are working hand in glove each and every day and have so enjoyed our time together and the, uh, just the honor and the privilege of working in a White House led by President Obama. So um, I couldn't do without, without what I do each and every day without Tina as my partner. So Tina, please come up and let's talk about each one of the champions. Congratulations again, everybody. Well, thank you, Valerie, um, and I am delighted uh, to be here um, and to be part of PTA Day at the White House and to be part of our team that is welcoming all of you here. Um, as, as Valerie just indicated, I mean, the PTA is something that is near and dear to all of our hearts, both um, remembering uh, my mother being so involved in the PTA, you know, uh, on behalf of me when I was, when I was a child, um, and then as a parent of, of both of my children um, as they've gone through school. So. Um, um, again, let me echo the thanks um, to all of you, those of you who are here, those of you who are the leadership, um, those of you watching um, uh, around the country for the work that you, you know, um, through the PTA do on behalf of um, the children of our country, you know, each and every day. So thank you very, very much. And especially on behalf of the First Lady, um, as many of you know, two of her signature issues are really ones in which PTAs, you know, have been instrumental and really involved with, and that's Let's Move, you know, our effort to, you know, help help our children lead healthier lives um, and end childhood obesity in a generation. Um, and the work that you all do in schools, um, both in terms of promoting healthy eating and more physical activity for our kids is so important. And our second initiative, Joining Forces, which is how each and every one of us across in our communities can help um, our military families and our veterans um, and um, the children especially of deployed military service members, um, our Blue Star and our Gold Star families is so important. And I know the PTAs have been instrumental in helping us with that effort as well. So on behalf of the First Lady, I want to especially thank you all for the work that you are doing. Um, and now, it is my singular pleasure uh, to uh, take us one by one and call up onto the stage um, each of our champions of change. Um, it's always a very exciting day, as Valerie said, here in the White House when we were able to, to recognize you know, people across the country who've really been active in their communities. And because this is the PTA, as I said, it's an especially um, a, a del delightful way to end the week for us here at the White House um, and celebrate all of you. So first is Ann Stafford. Anne, if you can come up while I talk about you <laughs> for the past 15 years. And it, we, for the past 15 years, Ann Stafford has served as a true advocate for parental involvement in education in Phoenix, Arizona. Her efforts have resulted in the creation of a school-based parent involvement resource center and the conception and development of a community outreach program that provides free personal hygiene items to students in need. So thank you, Anne. Our next champion of change is Sharon May Chang. Sharon May Chang has dedicated over 2,500 volunteer hours to the Portland Council PTA Clothing Center. As the current director, Sharon has reinforced the center's mission of providing thousands of students in need with clothing, as well as the self-confidence to be the best prepared for school that they can be. Thank you, Sharon. <laughs> Sam Maser. Sam is not only a parent, grandparent, 
foster parent and uncle to over 40 nieces, nephews, sons, daughters, and foster children, but also a PTA volunteer on local, state, and national levels. I don't know how he finds the time. <laughs> Through partnerships and collaborations with state and local agencies, he has helped raise awareness of the value of PTA in the state effort to provide the best possible educational outcomes for all of Maryland's children. Thank you, Sam. Deirdre Pierce, throughout her service as a local school PTA treasurer and president, school council representative and business partner, and current PTA district director of three Georgia counties, one of Deirdre Pierce's most notable accomplishments is successfully advocating for the complete renovation of her neighborhood high school, which resulted in the school board allocating funds for all high schools to have the same. Thank you, Deirdre. Mandy Peterson. Since 2008, Mandy Peterson has either chaired or served on most of the committees at the Oak Grove Elementary PTA in Raleigh, North Carolina. She currently serves as the Vice President of Fundraising and Family Nights, and she's previously been both treasurer and president. Thank you, Mandy. <laughs> Janelle Sperry. Janelle Sperry's 20 years of dedication to her local elementary school, the Berkeley County Council PTA and West Virginia PTA, have produced significant results. Not only has she secured grants for Bunker Hill Elementary School PTA for new athletic sites, technology, resource materials, and an outdoor science and nature center, but she also currently serves as the president of Mill Creek Intermediate PTA. Thank you, Janelle. Emily Sack. <laughs> Emily Sack um, is currently Vice President of Kurtz Elementary PTA in Milford, Michigan, and she's utilized PTA's volunteer opportunities both at the school and in classrooms to interact with other parents, the faculty, school administrators, and most importantly of all, our children. Thank you. Thank you, Emily. <laughs> Sharon Whitworth, for the past 36 years, Sharon Whitworth has been a PTA advocate for all children through her service as the 15th District PTA President, Kentucky PTA President, and current Kentucky PTA Legislative Commissioner. She's also spearheading a national PTA grant as project lead in an effort to educate parents in the community about the Common Core standards. Thank you, Sharon. <laughs> Melissa Kicklighter. As incoming vice president for regions and councils for Florida PTA, Melissa is an advisor to the Common Core State Standards Committee and lead instructor for those training modules and many others pertaining to advocacy and parent and community engagement. Thank you, Melissa. <laughs> Calvin Endo. With 11 children and more than 28 grandchildren, the two gentlemen on the panel have a lot of kids between the two of them, I have to know. <laughs> Calvin Endo's extensive involvement with the Wainea High School PTA in Hawaii have led him to his current positions as the school's PTSA president, as well as education chairman for the Wainea Neighborhood Board, which allows Calvin to work with the principals on the west side of Oahu and the Wainea Leeward Community College. Thank you, Calvin. Carlina Brown. A mother of four, Carlina Brown started family advocacy as a parent representative to the Policy Council with Head Start in Washington almost 20 years ago. She currently serves as PTSA president at Rainier Beach High School and co-director for the Southeast Seattle, uh, Seattle Council PTA. <laughs> Thank you, Carlina. <laughs> and finally, Anna Chapman. As an elementary school music teacher, the current Ohio PTA Director of Communications and the President of Grindstone Elementary PTA in Berea, Ohio, Anna Chapman's commitment as a parent, educator, and PTA advocate in her community is omnipresent. She has also previously served as Berea PTA Council President, Unit President, First Vice President, Historian, Webmaster, and Chairperson of numerous committees. <laughs> Thank you, Anna. 
So there you have our PTA Champions of Change. Congratulations to you all, and let's give them all another big round of applause. Thank you all again. They are representative of the great work that PTAs do across our country. And now I think you're going to have an opportunity to hear from some of them. So let me turn it back over to Kyle. Oh, picture. Picture with Tina. Picture. <laughs> Get in the middle. Thank you. All right. Uh, the PTA, oh, the PTA paparazzi. That's what yeah. you just said. <laughs> <laughs> you all deserve paparazzi for all your great work. All right. Thank you all, all right. very Thank much. Congratulations. All. And our second panel can grab their seats. Thank you so much, Tina. Appreciate it. All right, so we have two panels uh, with our Champions of Change uh, today. So I'm going to bring up a familiar face from today, uh, Massey Rich, who's going to be moderating our first panel. I'm back. <laughs> uh, all right, let's be honest. Who kept this napkin at lunch? <laughs> right? Like the president personally packed your lunch today, right? He's like, I'm going to put my seal on the napkin. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, anyway, we're delighted to have the, the champions here, and I'm delighted to be with you folks. Hello, folks. I feel like I know a lot about you uh, from your nomination forms. Um, I used to be a newspaper reporter before I got into this racket, so my instinct is to ask people a lot of questions, and we don't have time for that. Um, and I won't ask you deep probing investigative questions like, in 1979, you said. Um, but I, I want to pull some things from uh, what other folks said about you, both so we can hear about what uh, you have done in your communities, but also so we can take away some lessons that could apply for other communities and, and ways that people might learn from, from your PTA leadership. And Anne, I want to start with you. Uh, the giving closet, mm -hmm. what is it? What are you giving away? What's in that closet? <laughs> <laughs> and and what, what difference is that making in students' lives? Um, it's a program that we started a few years ago. My co-founder is actually here with me in the audience. There she is, Candle Burgess. Um, it started out of a need that we found. Um, the school had organized sort of a holiday, holiday help program. And we found that what a lot of the students were asking for were personal hygiene items. So they had the opportunity to ask for anything that they wanted during the holidays. And what they were asking for was soap and toothpaste and those things because they didn't have access to them. So um, we started looking at what happens to student achievement when they don't have access to those types of basic necessities. So we um, designed the program that students and their families can come in once a month and select um, items from the giving closet. And it's, it's all personal hygiene items. And it's all funded through um, grants and um, community donations. Great. And can you tell us what did you learn when you looked at what the impacts are when kids don't have access to those very simple items? Um, that's what we designed our goals around. And that those were um, to decrease incidences of bullying, to reduce absences due to illness from not having access to that, and to also um, increase their self-esteem and confidence. And that all relates to their student achievement rates. Mm -hmm. So when we think about the, the costs of chronic absenteeism, right. that we might be able to solve that with a bar of soap, some shampoo. <laughs> I mean, that we can it's chip away at that. It's definitely one of the that. factors. Yeah. yeah, right. No, but that's a start. Yes. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks. And where is that sort of as you look into the future, where's that program going, do you think, the Giving Club? Um, it's expanding every month. We have more and more um, families that come and make use of those resources, and we just keep reaching out to the community to help fund it every month, and it mm -hmm. just it keeps growing. There are we would like to expand it to further schools and throughout the state. Mm -hmm. I know a couple of you have uh, started programs like that a bit, and, and uh, Mandy, you've got one. You call it Pajama Pals. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, in um, 2008, we started Pajama Pals, and we collect um, new and used books and then new pajamas. And then at Christmas time, we adopt families from different schools. And um, we've adopted as many as 10 and had around 600 students because it's the student themselves as well as any child in the house from birth to age 18. And they all get a newer used book. Um, we try to give them new, but sometimes we don't have those in stock. Um, but we all give them new pajamas, and then our local dentist will donate um, pajama or toothbrushes and toothpaste. And then it's wrapped up, and some of the kids have come back the following year and said that's all they've gotten at Christmas, mm -hmm. which is touching, you know, considering that some of them don't even have books in their home or some of them don't have electricity, and it was those pajamas that kept them warm. Why would you pick pajamas? Um, it's just a basic thing. It's something I had three little kids, and my youngest, God love him, he loves pajamas. And, you know, he's always loved pajamas. And, you know, when you're not feeling well, the, you know, you go to the hospital, have a baby, the first thing you get is your pair of pajamas for the hospital. And, you know, if you're not feeling great, you want a, a nice pair of pajamas. You want, you know, to brush your teeth. You want a, a good book to read just to relax. So it's just a basic, a basic thing. So it doesn't have to be a grand gesture of an entire meal and food for your entire family, which is a need. But, you know, something as simple as pajamas and books can really help. So you take in, I think, now something like 75,000 mm -hmm. pairs of Yeah, pajamas, um, we had reached the 10,000 mark in 2010, and then we partnered with the Disney Give-A-Day program, and we collected about 40,000 um, in six months. And so we had a local storage unit that um, gave us space to help store them, but we've redistributed them all out to social services, even our own school, other schools, um, you name it, and we've been there probably. Ronald McDonald House, the credit union house in North Carolina. So Ann talked about plans she has to scale up her program. You've seen a lot of growth in your program. So what, what, what can you share with, with parent leaders who are starting something on a small scale? You know, 50 pairs of pajamas, 100 pairs, 50 books, 100 books, whatever well, it happens to be. And how do you get to 75,000? I mean, it just, it's a small idea that everybody can, can take part in. We've had Girl Scout groups. We've had Boy Scout groups. We've had um, just second grade classrooms, we've had um, the YMCA Guides and Princesses, a group of 10, and they'll collect 100 pairs of pajamas because you say, hey, I want to give a child a pair of pajamas. And most kids, you know, will say, hey, I'll buy pajamas, or here, they can clear off my bookshelf and, you know, take the used books, or we've had kids at book fairs who'll buy one book for themselves and then give two books to pajama pals. So it's just a basic thing that everybody can kind of wrap their mind around. Mm -hmm. And once you realize that every little bit helps, you know, even if you're helping one child, that still makes you feel as good as helping 10,000, 15,000 children. Mm -hmm. Since you do see 75,000 pairs of pajamas, what are the trends in pajama fashion right now? <laughs> well, we don't see very many Dora the Explorer anymore, mm. and SpongeBob is kind of yesterday's news. Okay. Right. I know you were thinking it, so. Um, no, uh, Deirdre, you've been involved on the, on the facility side yes. in particular, as, as we heard. Um, tell us about what that, that facelift project was for your school. Um, and then, as we've asked with the other folks, what, what difference has that made? What difference do facilities make in the, in the life of a school for students and for the teachers and the other adults who work in the building? Well, our facility wasn't very highly thought of for a very long time. Uh, living in a community, you're either a facilitator of change or you are one that sticks your head in the sand. Uh, I'm not one of those that does that. So, of course, my children went to the school that's in the neighborhood. They were going to go to their neighborhood school. So, of course, the building was an old building built in the 60s. So it was just standard, small, uh, got a lot of, it had a lot of issues. Uh, we happened to notice that a lot of the teachers were walking around with water bottles a lot of times. The kids were not drinking water. So it took a few of our parents to come in and start turning on the water faucets, and we realized quickly what, why they weren't drinking the water. There was rust coming out of it. And so we start investigating the building, walking around and seeing a lot of other things, and start taking that checklist, walking around, talking to the administrators and saying, okay, what's going on here? So, and, and you talk about the types of things of, um, you know, perception. A lot of our children were allowing the facility to determine uh, how they told people about their schools being McNasty. And we were offended by that. So we wanted to change the image of it, started pulling together, talking to the administration. We had a school board member that came along with us. We started talking to her because that's what school board members are supposed to do, help facilitate change. So we all got together, brought the board out, brought the architects out, told them what we wanted to have happen here. And they came in. 
They gave us some substandard drawings. We weren't satisfied with that. So we decided to say go back to the drawing board and bring us something better than this because our children deserve it. So they did. We finally found an architect that came in, caught our vision, and he brought us one of the greatest things. I had intended to bring those pictures with me because we're all quite proud of it. When you ask the question about what does a facility, how it changes people, you might be, not be able to change the inside readily, but if you can change the outside sometimes, it changes people's perception as they walk into a school. And that's important. It's very, very important. It's changed mindsets unbelievably. Mm -hmm. Now, all of these programs uh, that we've talked about so far, Anne's and Mandy's and Deirdre's, mm -hmm. uh, have involved donations, fundraising of some sort. Or, um, and Chanel, you're an expert at this, it sounds like. We've got <laughs> how many pages? Your nomination form from a friend of yours. <laughs> I can't tell you how many things she has raised money for. Um, so you've got to have some secrets. You're, I mean, you're a grant, you've written a lot of grants successfully, right? Yes. So are you willing to reveal some secrets no. to effective <laughs> grant writing? <laughs> Do we have to turn off the webcam? Before? I can tell but, you, but I'm going to have to kill you. But, uh, <laughs> yes. <laughs> I if it's for the kids. I mean, um, so, so just think about what, like, what are some tips? What, how have you been effective at, at, at finding, identifying opportunities and then pursuing them successfully? Sure. Um, actually, most of the grants that I've received have been through the West Virginia Legislature. Um, the first one was to pave a basketball court and track. Uh, we noticed that it was so rainy uh, that one season that the children had to stay inside for recess every single day, and they weren't getting any physical education. So we said, well, if we could at least put a track in, um, even if it wasn't raining, they keep the children in because of it being muddy outside. So we thought if we paved a track, at least they could walk out and walk on a paved track for exercise. So that's what started that. Um, and the second one was for a library makeover. We received $5,500 for a library makeover. And the largest was the last one that we actually just finished this spring was for an outdoor science and nature center. Uh, it took uh, about a year and a half to complete it. Thousands of hours were put into that center. But it's an amazing center. When you walk into it, there's a huge brick uh, paved walkway that goes through the center. Uh, there's a large greenhouse, a pond, a bridge for the children to walk over um, through the pond. Um, there's a, because we're in West Virginia, we wanted to include a state significance. So we put a miniature forest with black bear, which the black bear is our state animal. Uh, rhododendrons, our state flower. So we have a rhododendron area, uh, an outdoor classroom, butterfly garden, things like that. Uh, we have an archeology span area where the kids can dig for fossils and minerals. Um, and a huge 2,000 pound quartz pink rock. So there's every bit of science and nature that we can incorporate into that center. Um, and there's, there was nothing quite like the day that we unveiled it. We had a big grand opening and the children got to see it for the first time. And the one thing that I do remember was we had tree stumps that were included so that the children could count the rings on a tree. And I remember the kids going up and smelling the tree that they had really never had the chance to just smell a, a tree, a cut tree and how excited they were to smell what that smelled like. And it's, it's interesting to just see how important it is that not only they read things in a book, but that they experience and they smell it and they touch it. So it, it, it was a, it's a very impressive center. The kids absolutely love it. And this is the first year, I guess, in the fall that they're actually gonna be able to use it and the teachers are thrilled. She didn't really reveal any secrets. <laughs> Yeah, you know, I, I got it through um, my delegate in my area, and um, that was through the West Virginia legislature. All right. So you're, I know, uh, like many, most uh, PTA volunteers, you've also got a day job, right? I do. Uh, I run a mortgage company. Right. So what do you, it strikes me, you do work in the mortgage industry, and that's about so recognizing potential and opportunity and leveraging resources to make something bigger. So sort of what do you bring from your day life to your school PTA life that's helpful? Ooh. Um, that, that's a good question. Uh, because honestly, like, did you mortgage the school? <laughs> <laughs> no, <laughs> but you know, it's funny as I tell so many people that that's why I like PTA. It's because, um, in the mortgage industry, it can be a little aggressive and stressful. And mm. the fun part of my day is when I actually get to go into the school because sometimes, uh, with the economy the way it is and foreclosures, it can be a pretty negative environment during the day for me with what I do. Uh, but when I walk into my daughter's school, I'm a rock star. I mean, they all know me and they're waving to me and hi, Mrs. Sperry, and they're so excited. And it makes me feel like a rock star. <laughs> so actually, I, I'm not sure I can tie the two together. For me, I tell people all the time, I love the separation. 
So. Okay, thank you. Sure. Um, now, Sharon, I was looking at your application here that I've got, and your daughter nominated you, oh. right? Did you know that? There were several people who thought uh, that they. What's your daughter? I just told you. Who, yeah. yeah. <laughs> determine who actually. I'm giving did her it, the so. credit, but. Um, <laughs> She said, uh, first she called herself a fortunate daughter. That's how she signed it, which was very nice. Her, what's her name? Lara. Lara, yes, L-A-R-A, right? Yeah. Um, she said that you are often reminding students of something. Uh, we do have a voice even if we're still too young to vote. Talk about that and, and what that, you want that to mean to students. First off, I'm choked up, but I'm very honored. Um, I have done Boy Scouts and Girl Scouts. Um, my daughter's 31, my son is 26. So active with students, active with the PTA as a Stevenson Elementary PTA um, president and then with the Portland Council PTA president. But being active with kids, being reading, a reading friend with young students and stuff. But the thing I always tell students, whether we're at a PTA function or another function or if something's coming up in the legislature, that even though you are not old enough to vote yet, you can still give your opinion, you can still give your voice. And I encourage every child that I meet, if they have a concern, when I worked at a middle school, Jackson Middle School, the kids would say, I can't believe that they're doing this. And I said, you have a voice. You, can, you may not be able to vote, but you can give your voice. So I always encourage them. And I tell them with PTA, we are a group of people who are giving a voice to what your desires are for your health, your education, your welfare. We're here for you and we want more members, pta.org, so that we can have a stronger voice. Nice. And they'll be our voice. We're our voice for them now, but later uh, they'll be the voice for us. It's something that our, our secretary says a lot as well. I think of when he spoke at the PTA Legislative Conference and, and what he says is that uh, your kids, can't vote, they don't have lobbyists, they can't start PACs. Well, they might be able to now, I don't yeah, know what that, the laws yeah, are anymore. <laughs> but, uh, but then we have to give, we do have to, to, to speak up for them. But talk about, are there instances you can think of in your experience of where the students have spoken up, where they have directly spoken up and said, you know, here's what, we need, what needs to change, and what advice would you give for folks who, who could also sort of encourage that kind of student revolution uh, around the country? We actually in Portland, Oregon, have had several rallies where um, the high schools have gotten together with students and gone and marched downtown in our Pioneer Square to give voice to funding full education, to have an adequate you know, quality education that they rightly deserve and that we rightly need to provide for them to make our nation greater, to have educated people throughout our nation. One student uh, that we heard from in the process, and I, we all choked up when we read it, so I'm going to choke up again. Um, my name is, uh, wow. <laughs> my name is Jasmine Bolden. I like the idea of champions of change. My God. <laughs> and I would like to nominate my foster father. Can you tell us how you came to be Jasmine's dad? Well, and I really don't like to tell this story, but I will this time, you, you do they ask me. Um, I was a PTA volunteer about 12 years ago. The uh, second grade teacher said she needed male volunteers and I, and I decided to you know, participate in that. So I guess it was about a month into my um, volunteerism that the young lady came up and she said, can I come live with you? And I told her, no, you can't come live with me. You know, you just can't come live with me. You know, <laughs> this doesn't work that way. <laughs> so um, I guess about a month later, she asked me again, can I come live with you? And I said, no, no, you can't work that. You know, but she knew she was going to go into foster care in about a week. She, she understood that. So um, I guess it was about a month later, she was transferred out of the school, I didn't see her again anymore, but I went to wis visit my, um, my mother-in-law, my, my wife is here, I went to visit my mother-in-law in, in Anne Arundel County, another county um, from Baltimore, 
And, and she was, that very young lady, was on the playground. And again, she asked, could she come live with me? So this time, I really, I, you know, I took it seriously uh, that time. And my wife and I became um, foster parents for that young lady. You know, and, 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 Foster, the foster care people brought up to my house. Well, they, they called first. They said, look, you know, you've been approved. It's great, you know. We're going to bring her up to your home. And by the way, she has a sister. Can you take her too? Wow. You know? <laughs> so in the second grade, first grade, you know, the, uh, they, they came to my home. And now um, the young lady's in the 12th grade. She's still at my home. And, it, and it's worked out well. And the sister's gone on. And um, it, it's been a joy to have her in, the, uh, in my home. Great. Barbara Walters moment check. <laughs> um, so, thank you for that. And I, I don't really Sam, want to tell that story much. You know? No, I mean, it, yeah. you got to read this, folks. I mean, it, it is powerful. Um, so, the, you started a, a PTA chapter particularly for foster parents. I did, yeah. yeah. Why is that important, and, and how does a foster parent sort of might, how might they feel differently about their engagement with the school, and how might the school treat them differently uh, in your experience? Okay, first of all, let, let, let me give a, a, good sh a shout out and a thanks to, to PTA in general, because I received plenty of, of a professional development opportunities, and, and that sort of helped me in, in my child advocacy in terms of foster care. Oh, what was your question again? Uh, <laughs> you, start, you started a foster okay. parent PTA. A foster parent PTA, there yeah. we go, there we go. No, your name is the, Sam. The, 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 <laughs> No, and this is not just a Maryland problem, but the research says that, that foster children are often two to three grade levels behind their peers. You know? mm. And they also two to three grade levels in terms of their math skills and their reading skills. And, and it's really a sad situation. So you know, I, I, I thought, you know, how can I help our foster children in Maryland? And don't forget, this is a national problem. Every state has foster children. But how can I help the children in Maryland well, I said, wait a minute, I, I just finished my term as PTA president of Maryland. I know we can help foster children, and I know we can do it. We have a great uh, parent engagement program, and, and i got to tell you, the, the, the building successful partnerships that, national, that uh, PTA taught me about, I begin to create partnerships with the Maryland Resource Parent Association, that's the Maryland Foster Parent Association, uh, the Maryland PTA, the Maryland PERC, the Maryland State Department of Education, the Maryland Department of Human Resources, and I said, look, foster parents need a great parent engagement program. So what I did, I took the PTA content, I added some child welfare content to that, and we created a parent involvement um, a piece that, that's really been um, presented all over the state. And thanks to the University of Maryland Department of Human Resources, we, we've been able to reach a lot of foster parents and give them that special parent engagement piece. Because even though PTA created a great piece, you have to understand that foster children have an extra piece, and that's the trauma piece. Every single foster <coughs> child has been traumatized in some way. You know, so that's what we do. Sam, you, I read, have referred to PTA, in your view, as the most effective parent support group in the nation. And I think we think of PTA as a student support group, a school support group, a teacher support group. But I wonder if ev everyone who would like to contribute on this is uh, talk about in what way the organization is about supporting each other as parents and, and ways that you've been doing that. If you don't mind, I'll start. Yes. Um, current, well, back when my daughter, she's now in fifth grade, but in first grade, a teacher at the school had lost her house to a fire. And it was really a community effort that we just spearheaded to get her furniture. She needed basic supplies. She needed gift cards. She needed... Um, food, she needed pots, pans, anything. And it was really the school community, it was parents at the school who didn't even know this teacher. It was pa friends of parents at the school who heard about her in the paper that really came together. And even to this day, our current president, who is one of my best friends and, you know, just amazing, but um, she's undergoing breast cancer treatment. And we've all, you know, been right there supporting her the entire way. And she's got a long road ahead of her, but she knows that with a great team, because that's what the PTA really is, it's just a good team of people, 
and um, she knows with all of us behind her that you know we'll continue what she can't do and we can pick up the pieces that she can't complete on her own and I think that's you know kind of what the PTA is at least with our school is just a big network of friends and working together and our common goal is just to help our kids and if we help everybody's kids it's great and it's you know like Janelle was saying where you walk in the school and you're kind of a rock star and everybody knows you and they know you know hey we need this because sometimes they know that the PTA is struggling for money and they know that you know they don't want to do another fundraiser for this and that but you know if you hear about a need they know that you're going to try really hard and come up with creative solutions and that's what a good team can do Great. Great. and I'd like to add to that and say that uh, PTA for the most part a lot of people think that we just live to fundraise uh, we do that too we do bake cookies periodically sit a little uh, wrapping paper and whatever but we are we're therapeutic to each other we actually kind of share stories that help us in all kinds of ways. Uh, we are advocates first and foremost, and we advocate for each other, we advocate for our children, and we advocate for our communities, and we ad just advocate in general. That's our primary title and primary purpose. And sometimes it's a little difficult to get that through to some people, but we do speak loudly about it, and we support a lot of wonderful things. It's basically like what uh, you know was just said here. So we, we help each other a lot. And again, it's that, that professional development opportunities that, that the PTA offers us. You know, we, we become not only be trained PTA leaders, we, we become advocates for the, the community in general. PTA help. So, what are the things that you think America's parents need to have on their minds as we go into the new school year? As we talked about sort of building capacity earlier in the morning, we talked about uh, all the policy changes, reforms that are happening, lots of change happening in education right now. What would your advice be on you know, what parents should be reading up on, what questions they should be asking uh, their child's teacher, the school principal, uh, what PTAs should be thinking about as they go into this new school year? Sure. I would like to say that for parents and community members, anybody who has an interest in children, it's not just about the parents, it's about the community. It's about all of us reaching out to our children and making a better life for them. It's about each of us individually. We all have a wonderful gift that we have within ourselves that we can share with the world. And I encourage each of us, pick what you love and share it. Go to the school, offer to read with a student. If you love chess, start up a chess club, work with math, work with science, work with the things that you're good at because when you share your passion, a child is gonna catch that fire and perhaps that little spark is gonna say, I could do that. I would love to do that. That spark in you can light up so many children. So I encourage everybody and all the people who are listening, please find your passion and share your passion. Share your gifts with other people. I would also yeah. encourage um, parents to find to look for ways at the school to collaborate with the school. We were talking earlier in one of the breakout sessions, the difference between um, involving parents and engaging parents. And a lot of times um, we may design, the school may design a program and then look to parents for feedback or um, ask them what they think of a program after it's already been designed or even after it's already been implemented. And then we say, there, we involved parents. You know, parents were involved in the process. Um, and I would like to see more of a collaborative process where parents are involved in the design of programs. So we're actually collaborating together and that's parental engagement and that's the difference between engagement and involvement. So I'd like to encourage parents as the school year starts to look for those opportunities or to create those opportunities themselves when they see the need in their child's school. Mm -hmm. So you're champions of change. Right? I feel like we should have had an Olympic <laughs> moment earlier to the season for that. What does that mean to you? You're joining us, this fraternity of uh, champions on other aspects of education, teachers and principals and folks who are championing change on the environment or health care or housing, a lot of different issues. This is a, a, pro, a large program that you've heard. What did it mean to you to get the, the email that, uh, that you'd been selected and and how are you not going to let us down uh, <laughs> as you continue this work? Because now, like, you got up your game, right? So, Janelle, what are you going to do next? No pressure. No pressure. No pressure. <laughs> mm -hmm. 
Um, actually, I think it's so inspiring to hear the other stories. Um, it's ironic. I wonder how many of us, when you were talking about your program or you were talking about your pajama program, were thinking, I could do that at my school and was already planning it in your head how you could do that. And um, I, I share that interest, I think, with everyone that was chosen to be a champion. Um, so I say basically we just need to keep pushing forward and uh, I, I think it's very motivating to be around people when you hear their stories. It just makes you want to do more. So we just have to keep doing more. Mandy, what about you? Um, I mean, I think it's going to be great um, to kind of get the conversation started to let people know that they don't have to create an entire program to work around that you know when I started I had two little boys at home they were one and three and I was the treasurer and I pretty much did it from home because that's what I could do and some people count box tops but that's what they can do to contribute some people work full-time and they still want to be involved and it doesn't have to be a grand movement but every little every moving cog in the whole picture helps and I think it helps you know for people to realize hey you know I could help with that or I have a question about this and just get the conversation going about different changes they can make. Deirdre, what's next? Well, for me, first of all, I'd like to say that was a wow moment for me, a wow <laughs> moment <laughs> in getting that email. Uh, one thing about Champions of Change, um, we do realize that we are, it's not about a personal agenda, and the agenda is all children, and we speak for every child with one voice, and that is something powerful that we can do all the time. Sam, any, we're not going to expect you to take any more children. <laughs> I do have two at home. I might send to your house occasionally. <laughs> What's next for you? I, I'm still going to. I'm going to continue to to raise the awareness that our, that our foster youth need the help of the PTA and other community members to to do uh, increase their educational outcomes in a positive manner. That's really important. Sure. I think for me, um, it's such an honor to be nominated and have this award. It's mind boggling. But what I will put out is that within each of us is a champion and within each of us, we can change our environment. When we see a need, we can step up to the plate and help out. I know with our PTA Clothing Center, it started in 1964 because the superintendent had absentee issues with families. He asked one of the mothers, you know, why is it that the boys don't come? Some days one will come, some days the other will come. And she very humbly said, I can only send one at a time because we only have one pair of shoes for the kids. So that kept that family from going to having their kids go to school. So that's how our PTA clothing center was established in 1964. And it continues to grow children. Every year we serve more children. We have more volunteers. We have more people like companies like Nike and Columbia Sportswear and Old Navy that have stepped up to help us provide clothing for the kids. And parents out in the community and our families with the school, they provide the gently used clothes. They provide funding so that we can give the kids some new clothes so they can go to school with pride. So when they start school, they have some new clothes and stuff, and they have some school supplies. It makes all the difference. So give what you can, when you can, and where you can. And I think for um, our school, it just shines a spotlight on everything that we've been doing, and it is going to help g gather support from our community, and um, just lets them know the important work that we're doing, and shows the successes that we've that we've had and what we hope to do in the future and kind, kind of sets an example for other schools and shows them the possibilities that, that, you know, that can be had. I said I was a reporter, so I was scribbling the whole time, writing things down, and I, just some takeaways before we have to, to move to meet some, uh, another set of great folks. It, you know, it, it doesn't have to be a grand gesture, he said, um, Mandy, you know, make it something that's manageable Give what you can when you can. You don't have to be overwhelmed by all of the issues that, that we face, but find something that you can contribute that's right for you and that your schools need. You know, be walking the hallways, be listening to teachers, be listening to students. What do they need? And how does that fixing that need tie to student achievement? How do basic toiletries uh, contribute to getting kids to school? Um, and when you are <laughs> ready to be, do something pretty big, you can ask Sam. Uh, <laughs> How to do that? Um, but uh, you know, thank you for uh, for.
for sharing these stories, these ideas. I know little light bulbs were going off in this room, at home, I hope, as well. Uh, we want to see this, these champions of change go out and spread the word so we have more champions of change uh, working in your communities. Deirdre, you said we demand something better than this because our children deserve it. Thank you. All right, we can bring our second panel on up. All right, so as our uh, second panel takes their seats, I'm sorry this day has to end. It's been pretty fun so far. Um, but to, uh, to continue our, our day and to, to lead this panel, uh, someone who I have the pleasure with, of working with on, on a daily basis, uh, the liaison, li liaison in our Office of Public Engagement who coordinates women's outreach, uh, Hallie Schneier, is going to take the lead. Hi, everyone. How are you? As Kyle mentioned, my name is Hallie Schneier. And let's do one more huge round for our champions. Thank you guys so much for everything that you're doing. Oh, thanks. This is me. <laughs> Terrific. All right, well, it really is an honor to be here today. I'm so excited that folks are here from all over the country, all different walks of life. So what I'm hoping that we can get to do a little bit is kind of get to know you all a little bit better and how you got your start here. I know we've got folks at home. We've got Massey, who's going to get started in the PTA here pretty soon. So just getting to know folks a little bit better and what was it and when was it that you were able to kind of get involved? And Anna, maybe we could start with you and, and how you got your start with the PTA. Well, as a teacher, I knew the importance of parents being involved in their child's education. So I knew I would be at some point when, my, when I had kids. And when my oldest was in kindergarten, I went to my first PTA meeting. I, I just thought I was expected to go. It was, it was in the newsletter, it said to go, so I went. <laughs> and, um, and I was the only parent there other than the few members of the board and the principal. And um, I kept going. <laughs> I think most of us here probably have had that experience. Um, but I just thought it was important to be involved and to try to do um, better things for our school. That's wonderful. And, and Carlina, did you, what was your experience like? When did you get involved? I started off in the Head Start program as you, you have to do your volunteerism and I was with at a table with four-year-olds doing shaving cream and I said there's got to be something else I could do because I just don't do this. And, <laughs> uh, the teacher says, well, we do need a representative to represent the parents to this next level. It's like, I could do that. That I could do. And so it started off and I worked my way up into a state representation doing that and then also being um, a contractor with the ACFS doing the auditing. We went to different states or different programs that did auditing for parent involvement and social services. And then from there I went out, of, when all my kids got through Head Start, we were um, moved into a smaller town and the school really didn't need advocacy work like what I was doing, so I did other things, um, managing cheer programs, being involved in my church with the students and things like that. And then when I came to and uh, moved into Seattle after losing my job and was hoping I can get work by moving into the city, um, I was unemployed and went to Rainier Beach High School. And my vice president and secretary were all there. They were all recruiting. And they gave you this list. It says, well, what are your skills? I'm like, well, I could do this. 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 And they're like, you know what? You might as well come to a meeting. Next thing you know, <laughs> I was. I was involved and there was a lot of work already being done and but because I was able to give a lot of time and I was on my last child um, so I didn't have a lot of things at home I can go to the school and so that's how it all got started and then the next year I was voted in as president surprisingly and it's like okay so what does this happen so a lot of the work that I that um, the, the pavement was already made I just mm -hmm. joined a very um, powerful locomotive and we went forward with that. That's great. So, yeah. And it sounds like it was an organization that you were able, as you moved, 
were able to stay with it and it was something of, yes of we um, yes we work we walk as one we um, always have talking points we have the talking points down we meet and we are one voice so we are synonymous with Rainier Beach High School and when you hear the names of Carlina Brown Rita Green Lake Lucretia Lake Claytor it's plus Rainier Beach High School you know it's always <laughs> it, that's addition and so we are always represented and always wearing our orange and blue I love it. Mm -hmm. And Calvin, you have a very interesting story. How have you got started? Actually, I got railroaded into it. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe a lot of people here can relate, actually, but are glad they did. Well, <clears throat> and remind us where you're from. Let, let me start with this. Uh, um, I worked for the Navy for 30 some, some years, uh, and I just felt led uh, by God to, to leave the, the shipyard took an early retirement at age 51 and uh, go help the high school because we were, they were getting into a, a, a smaller learning communities. The, the, if having kids focus on, on their goals in, in the future for, for job uh, employment, I felt uh, it was a good time for, for me to be there and have someone from the business world be part of the school. And uh, my wife and I, uh, we have 11 children, so we really watch education. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, 28 uh, grandchildren, as you heard earlier. Um, so we were look, looking at the school to, to see how, how can we get involved and, and, and make a change and, and just support the school. Uh, and then we, we were on the school council and we felt uh, something's not happening with parent involvement. So we found out there's a, uh, there was a PTA, uh, this couple, uh, that, uh, their special ed teachers were keeping, uh, kept it going. Uh, so we asked, oh, can we be part of it? And uh, they said, oh, sure. I said, you want to take it over? <laughs> <laughs> So my wife, my wife agreed. <clears throat> I didn't want anything to do with it because I, I, I was already on our neighborhood board and chairing the education committee. I, I worked closely with all the, the churches in, in, in my community, working with the youth, uh, very involved. <clears throat> and, and just so happened, <clears throat> our state <clears throat> came out with this policy saying, if you're a DOE, uh, Department of Education employee, <clears throat> You cannot hold a position where you can ha sign checks. So uh, my wife uh, says, "Well, I guess instead of becoming the her becoming the president, <laughs> they needed a check signer. So she be decided she'll be take the secretary treasurer job. Well, she, maybe the treasurer job that time. We had another person take the secretary job." <clears throat> And she looked at me and says, would you like to be the president? <laughs> and you never looked back. And I never looked back. And then we, we, uh, one, one of uh, our kids was at the middle school. Uh, and we, we checked it, if the middle school had a PTSA going. And they had one, but it was uh, not active. So we got it active again. And at that point, the, the state office began to say, Calvin Endo, he's the president of the high school, and now he's involved with in resurrecting the intermediate. Let's invite him to the state board. <laughs> Finding you out. <laughs> yeah. So that, that's kind of how I, I got involved, and I'm kind of glad I did. I think folks out by you probably could say the same. It's a great story. Now, and Emily, can you tell us a little more how you got involved and remind us where you're from? I am from Michigan. I, my, our children go to Milford, uh, in Milford, Michigan, to Kurtz Elementary. Um, I started off, I had twins, or have twins, and when they started off in kindergarten and first, and I was successful to kind of avoid the whole PTA thing. <laughs> <laughs> I'm being honest here. And you, you kind of, when you're someone that likes to help, you can't avoid it, I think. It gets to that point where you go, I can't just sit on the sidelines and go, yeah, you guys handle that. And it got to a point where we had a need to fill board members, and my husband said, you should do it. And I said, okay, if you're sure, and here I am. <laughs> That's great. 
great to hear. And Sharon, how about you? My, mine's probably a little different story. Mm -hmm. I, I also tried to start when my child was in kindergarten, and I was very backward and shy. Somebody said the other day, shy, that's you? <laughs> but yes, I was. I wouldn't even go to the grocery store by myself. But when my five-year-old decided that he, you know, he was going to kindergarten, or he didn't decide, but he was going to kindergarten, <laughs> and I took him and my, my three-year-old with me to the school, and when I went into the kindergarten class, I actually, among other kindergarten parents, was told, we don't need you all. We have college educations. We don't want volunteers. And a lot of us, of course, went home and cried. I cried because I was an at-home mom and I wanted to be involved in my child's education. And a couple days later, the principal called and said, we don't do that in our school. I don't know why that particular person told you that. Come back. And, and I did. I went back. And from there, it led to uh, just being involved and being in the district, realizing the district was very important. Uh, my son, when he got in high school, said, Mom, are you going to be PTA president when I get in college? And I said, that's, that's, a, that's a good idea, son. That's a really good idea. Uh, and, and then I realized that part of my goal was to get other parents involved in their child's education because it was an important thing to do. Good for you for having the strength for that. That's fantastic. Oh, how about you, rounding us out? Well, um, I was probably everybody. a mixture of a little bit of everything. Um, I was traditional in the sense that my oldest child, I have three children in school. Actually, I have twins as well, oh, but they are my youngest. Yes, my, I'm from Jacksonville, Florida. Um, and my, uh, the agreement with my husband and I at the time was that I was actually going to be the school advisory council parent and get involved that way, and he was going to be the PTA dad. Well, that lasted for one meeting, and then somehow I was needing to go for him because he was working. And so pretty soon, I was doing both, and he was like, good, honey, you're doing great. You just keep doing that, um, which I'm sure is just because he thought I was doing a great job. But um, and from there, you know, just kind of felt the waters a little bit. I was volunteering in my, my son's kindergarten class. And um, that some other volunteers came up to me and said, you know, would you like to actually take a position on the board? And I said, sure, you know, just something real little. And, and so I started, went into the summer, and I was going to be the sunshine math coordinator, you know, just do the little ditto sheets and score them, and I can do that. And then by the time the summer was over, I was the treasurer. So I guess my math skills, which my children would disagree with, um, somehow became um, a gift to them. And I went from being treasurer to somehow them becoming president. And actually, I was very blessed in that I had some very kind um, people from my elementary school, I shouldn't say mine, my children's elementary school, who um, actually encouraged me and said it would really be nice to see you take your vision to a larger stage. And um, we were very blessed in our school to have a, a large volunteer population. Um, and it was just a matter of guiding them. And then when I reached out to other schools within a very large school district that we're in, I realized the need was huge, and that's when I moved on to district level um, of involvement, and now I'm blessed to be at the state level as well. Oh, that's fantastic. Thank you so much. Those are, those are great stories that I'm sure everyone here and at home can relate to. And something that in reading everyone, all of our champions have written some pieces on the work that they do and a little bit about how they got there. If you haven't had a chance, it's actually whitehouse.gov slash champions. And everyone's been kind enough to sort of author a piece about their experience. And something that was the most interesting that I think would be helpful to a lot of, a lot of folks here are the stories about increased engagement and sort of what's worked, what hasn't. You know, I was telling folks before, I was pretty heartened that there wasn't a lot of, I have 90,000 Twitter followers sort of thing, but that really getting, engaging with people on a very personal level. So Anna, I think you were, I think it was your story talking about saying yes and yes. getting started. So what are some, some things that have worked in terms of engagement and, and that sort of thing where you are? Well, in our case, we combined, this last school year was the first school year of this new school that mm -hmm. I'm the president at right now. And it was very important to us that we took the traditions from the three schools that we were merging into one as well as starting new traditions. So that planning started over a year before the building was even built. And we were lucky to find great people 
from each of those school communities who are willing to serve on the board and together um, we got together and started brainstorming how are we going to get people involved in this school and um, care about this new school because everyone was stuck to their old one. So we just, I, I strongly believe in if you build it, they will come. And um, we did everything we could think of. Um, we started emails, we started, you know, we were in the newspaper, we, um, Facebook and Twitter, um, word of mouth, saying people, this is a new PTA, we have new people, um, we care about what everybody wants, and we want you to come on board and, and support us. And they started coming. Um, also, just asking people, instead of just sending them a letter, mm -hmm. asking them, saying, you, you'd be good at this. And, um, and we've built up quite a volunteer base, which is great. And not only parents, but also so many grandparents that That's either right. are parenting right now, or they just live in the community. Mm -hmm. And also, um, friends, dads, we have a huge dad population too, so. Oh, that's great. that's great. And who, I think, Emily, was it you who started BUDS? Did it, no. that, Melissa, do you wanna talk a little bit about BUDS and sure. recruitment experiences there? Absolutely. Um, it, as I said before, our volunteer population at My Children's Elementary School, and again, this was about a decade ago, it, we had volunteers, but they were primarily of the female persuasion, <laughs> so, which is traditional. Uh, and, but we realized that there were dads who were kind of there, but not necessarily doing something specific. And we, I had honestly had a lot of interaction and learning through leadership convention or, and leadership conference and learned more about you know, how to engage men into the schools and in finding other ways of doing it. And so I thought, well, you know, maybe we'll try that. Well, to be honest, this was my way of getting my husband back, or I mean <laughs> getting him re-engaged after, um, you know, I had kind of headed in the PTA route as well. And so when I became the PTA president, I kind of said, looked at him and I said, you know, it'd be really nice if we had you guys in here and what do you think of starting something to, to increase male involvement? So what we did is we created what we call the Buds Club, which is brothers, uncles, dads, etc. And um, we put out there an interest form and just really asked for some different kinds of things, not just can you come in and move furniture. But what else, you know, do you have a particular gift? Might you be able to help with technology or a career day? Or what other gifts and talents might you have to share with us because we're looking for new program ideas? And their response was tremendous. Um, we also had some dads that we knew reach out personally and ask other dads, hey, listen, I'm going to go do this. What do you think you want to join me? And it just really snowballed into something that became about a, every other month uh, program from everything from dads coming in and having a pancake pig out with their kids before school um, and to coming in and reading to classes before school, just a few minutes with them. Um, it, and that connection was huge and kids were just elated because maybe where some of them had had their moms, you know, go on field trips or be there a little bit more often, all of a sudden dads were connected too and it was really a family affair. That's terrific. And Emily, I know you were talked about a little bit about reluctance getting in, so how have you managed to hook other people in with you? Well, it, I think the biggest thing is talking to people, just being there, being a friendly face at the school. Um, I'm not a big go up and force people into things, but I find that just making friendships with people and just hearing what they're going through, and especially with finding, like talking about the BUDS program, um, I wish I had pen and paper, I wanna write that down. <laughs> Kelly, I know you're watching, write that down. <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, no, I lost my train of thought. But, you know, just getting together with people, and I think just treating people kindly. It's, it's the kindness is, I try and go back to that. It, it really is where people get kind of caught up in what their agenda is or what they want to do. And when you take the time to sit back and go, oh, okay, so that's kind of where at. That, I'm going through that too. And you can kind of relate in some ways or you can just hear the story. And I think that that helps a lot. That then people, when they talk to someone that on a, I'll say a real level, they feel a little more comfortable about getting involved. Because like I said, I was a little reluctant 
getting involved in the PTA, but then when you see and when you are interacting with people and you realize that it's really kind of fun um, and that it's, it's a positive thing and it's ultimately for the kids, so. That's fantastic. And I know Carlina, in, I picture Seattle as this very, I haven't been in a very long time, very bustling, highly caffeinated place where every, <laughs> all of the parents are extremely busy, you know, and, and getting anyone for, for five minutes has to be just really a labor of love. Yeah. So what's, what's working out by you? Well, I hope you, I was gonna hope you asked this question because um, one of the things that we are extremely busy, we, um, we have what we call day jobs, um, professional jobs, and so a lot of our time is evening time. In the middle of the night, lots of emails. We're big social media users, and there it will. it's not unusual for us to have within an hour 30 emails, but amongst us back and forth, having wow. conversations that way. Um, so that is something we do regularly. Um, and we have solved the world's problem doing that, trust me, <laughs> um, and planned parties that way. But one of the things that we have done is we have, um, we advocate so strongly for parent engagement, and we received a um, opportunity from the state of Washington, and our school was chosen to receive a million dollars, and it's a one-time gift that we are going, we're hoping to use to transform our school and bring in some capacity and some things, and one of the things that the PTSA did was write a job description for a parent engagement coordinator, uh -huh. and we presented that with basically a very strong arm is basically how we do things. You cannot tell us no. There's just absolutely <laughs> no way to tell us no. We do a lot of research, and and we do, um, because of our professional jobs, a lot of us come with an experience on how to create and do this kind of work. And so we were able to create a, a job description and that person is, their main job is to do parent engagement and to engage, because um, we use, uh, you lose a lot of parents in the high school level. So it's to get those parents back into the classrooms and into the school and hopefully they'll come to the PTSA meetings <laughs> by being encouraged. But that really is in having a full-time position um, with that and uh, hopefully, and we're actually two schools received this in our school district, uh, received this money and both schools are adopting our job description and uh, doing that. But that was one of the things we've been doing. That's fantastic. To help with that, yeah. Oh, wow. That's great. And I'm going to move over to Sharon and ask, it sounds like you've been active sort of seeing it through and through high school. Well, and through high school and, yeah. and the, the district. I want to say I'm from Kentucky. I don't think I said that at the yes. beginning. But um, at the district level, because I'm the project team leader from a great grant that the National PTA gave us for the Common Core State Standards, uh, we are reaching out to get parents engaged in their children's education because that's really, really important. And one of the great tools is the parent guides that National has for the Common Core State Standards. And in doing over 50 workshops and 10,000 people since October, we are wow. able to get those guides out and engage parents in their children's education because the tools on the back where it talks about things that you can do at home with your child in that grade level with that common core state standards is just wonderful tools for parents and I think that's important we got to build relationships with parents and we get them involved in their ch education show them what PTA can do they become involved in the PTA and that engages them oh that's great and Calvin how about by you you know no, I don't have a, a large membership, but I do have a large community-based support, uh, and, it, and that's been kind of cool. Um, when I ask the, the, the businesses, the, the, the stores around us, uh, I need this for the teachers. I, I, I can't see, you know, like McDonald's, I, I told them, I cannot see our teachers going and buying cups for, for refreshments, and we support me. So now our local McDonald's, I can ask them for anything, right? And they, they give me cases of cups and, and whatever I ask for. Uh, it's it's kind of awesome. And, and, the, yeah, the, and the two local stores, uh, when I ask them, uh, they'll give me whatever I ask for. Uh, we had one business that, that <clears throat> I asked the metal shop teacher, he, he, he was, because with the cuts, you know, they, they cannot afford the purchasing the supplies look like they used to, and metal is expensive. So I asked him, who's the supplier for the school? And he gave me that. <laughs> so I wrote the guy, <clears throat> the company, and he says, what do you want, Calvin? 
So I went back to the teacher, what do you need? <clears throat> so I wrote him a letter. He gave me, I mean, thousands of dollars of material for, for the shop. So, so, you know, we have great community uh, members out there. One, one, one lady I, I need to give a shout out to, uh, and, and some of you might want to pick up on this lady. She's a real estate agent, right? And one day she was watching the, the, the news and, and the, 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 they're talking about the school struggling and she said, God, somebody has to help them. <clears throat> and this is what she tells me. She says, God told her, why don't you help them? <laughs> so you know what she did in her, in her local area? She went to the schools and said, well, what are some of your needs? So the, she, she made a list, made a website. She sent it out to the businesses she knew in the, on that side of the island. The businesses came back and says, we got it. <clears throat> she made the news, <clears throat> right? <laughs> because she was doing that. Now she, she's doing the whole state. It's called, called community uh, uh, supporting schools. Community <clears throat> supporting schools? Yeah, so, so now she, she's launched the, the whole state and, and getting businesses. Uh, and she always calls me because uh, besides picking up stuff for myself, a lot of times I'm, I'm picking up things for, for other, other schools. Uh, so, you know, your community base, people are willing to give. Just right, you mentioned how the, your community came uh, and helped rebuild that school. I mean, you know, so they're out there. That's a beautiful story, and reminds us that we don't we don't know until until we ask, right? Yeah. And I know this is a good community community of askers. So now, it we are reminded it's you know sort of back to school season and and getting ready. So as we close it out, what are what's your favorite? project that you're headed back to and we'll just do kind of a lightning round going down starting with Emily. Oh boy. Um, or one that that you've worked on previously that's continuing. Jeez. We can start at the other end too. Oh, yeah, that'd be great. <laughs> <laughs> I stopped thinking there for a minute. That's the hot potato. <laughs> Actually, I'm looking forward to our monthly family events. We provide monthly family events for our, um, our 850 families at little or no cost okay. to them. And it may be a dance or uh, the first one is a big hot dog cookout nice. outside. And we're from Cleveland, Ohio, and it's not you know, the warmest climate, but last year, the day we did it, it was 97 degrees. Oh my gosh. Um, but we served 1,100 hot dogs and everybody had a great time. So every month it's something different. This year we're looking forward to a culture fest oh, cool. and a family game night. So oh, that's what great. I'm excited about. Oh, terrific. Carolina, all right, Carolina how about you? Uh, so I just graduated my last uh, four, and Ooh. so I'm kind of excited to not have to do the senior year all over again. So. <laughs> um, but I am really looking forward to continuing this um, Champions of Change for Rainier Beach High School is huge for us. We have um, a community that has been silent. Um, for many different reasons, and I mean, we could speak all day about it, but this is really large, so I'm really looking forward to taking this award and just um, making it shine in South End Seattle and really seeing what we've put in a lot of hours, it's been a lot of hard work and it's been a lot of debate and a lot of conversations and sometimes very hard conversations, yeah. but this is a lot of validation for the work we've been doing and um, it has not, um, it's not that it's not been seen, because we've definitely been getting a lot, and as the more we speak out, the more people come to us, but this has been true validation, so I'm really excited to take this back home and um, push further. Excellent, well thank you so much for being here and thank for you. sharing these stories, we appreciate it. Calvin, what's, what's up next? A couple of things, uh, um, just recently the, the Department of Education Hawaii uh, really is gonna push parent involvement. So they, they, they called uh, Liz Sager, our, our president, and she lives on another island, and uh, met, met with her, and, and, and later on she, she informed us PTA is gonna be very involved with, with the Department of Education in that area. And they, they hooked us up with another group called, the acronym is HEE, H-E-E-E. It's called, um, it's a cool name, it's, it's HUI, for excellence in education. 
They've been wanting us on, on the table for a while, and this is a, a, a group of people, <coughs> businessmen, educators, special education people, that, that want education to be excellent in Hawaii. So they, they meet together to discuss what are some of the things we're gonna to bring to, to uh, our legislators to, to get support. The very next day when I get back on Tuesday, I, I got a meeting with them. We're gonna tackle one of the things we would talk about in a workshop, bullying, and how it ties into suicide. And why is it that the state does the survey that's showing high bullying, high suicide, but th there's really not much education or support at the teacher level and, and, and our ad admin level to uh, deter these things from happening. So we're gonna tackle that the very next day when I get back. Nice, <laughs> that's good to hear. Oh. And Melissa, how about you? In addition to buds, you've got a couple <laughs> other things going on, I imagine. Well, yeah, well, besides three teenagers <laughs> at home, but oh my gosh. hi guys. Um, I, first of all, I am transitioning uh, to put my primary focus on the state of Florida, which is exciting. But to be honest, and of course, being an active volunteer within the community, but a couple of things that I do want to share, because I'm very proud uh, of the work that was done um, all the way through my children's elementary school career, nine years. Um, the thing I'm probably most proud of is the faculty uh, partnership with PTA because I truly believe that while we are, you know, the people who can be kind and welcome people and invite them to be part of what we do, we have to have a strong partnership with the faculty of our schools uh, because they're the ones doing the work in the trenches. And if we partner together, they have the subject matter education expertise to provide the high quality programming and to share that information that parents need. And we can be kind of the conduit through which that can happen because we welcome the people in and we can do the logistical stuff. We can make the ask to get the support from the community to maybe you know have food, have a fun parent and, and child student night. Um, so that work, I think, is just critical because the work that's happening in our schools every day is really just the foundation of everything in, in PTA. Without that, everything else we do doesn't exist. Um, but probably the program that, um, while I'll be distantly involved with it, I'm, I'm very, very proud of is what um, we created over the last few years in our, our district in Duval County, and that's the Superintendent's Leadership Academy where we um, went back to our roots of advocacy with our students. Because as we were starting to become stronger advocates and learning better how to do that, um, especially through the support of the National PTA and the Common Core State Standards Initiative, um, we were reaching out to parents and then we started listening to student stories and we realized they can tell this story better than anybody. And so um, we went back and we said, let's go back to our student leadership focus. And we reached out to all of our high schools within the district. We asked our principals to nominate students to come in and um, be part of the student leadership training and learn how to be advocates themselves. Um, we used some of the Common Core, we used some uh, other great information, community resources came in. Um, and now those students now travel to Tallahassee and tell the story and they work with our state legislator. They're the ones involved with social media in every aspect because they know it all better than we do. And they are out there, they're tweeting, they're on Facebook, they're showing up outside restaurants when they find out there's a state legislator in town and they're going out there and saying, do, can we get a minute and can we talk to you? Um, they're fighting the fight and we're there to now support them. And what's happening is the parents are getting more engaged because their kids are engaged. And even now, I have elementary school and middle school kids that are saying, I can't wait till I get to high school so I can be part of that too. So while you know the tor torch has passed and I'm confident, I know this will continue and we have great people who will do it, um, it's probably the most powerful program that I've been a part of. That is so cool. Awesome. Oh, yeah, seriously. Yeah. Sharon? Well, Kentucky, as a lot of y'all might know, is was the first state to sign on to the Common Core State Standards. And we're the first state that is tested. So we just tested this past spring. So one of our biggest goals is, is to reach out to all of our parents, not only in our district where we have our, our grant, but also in the state, 
to uh, tell the, pa the parents about the accountability and the testing, what the scores are going to be because, you know, with the new standards, the scores could be a little bit lower. We've got to encourage parents to and make them understand that that's okay. So that's going to be a, a big thing of our project this year. I have my team leaders back here. Uh, couldn't do it without my team, but we already got 25 schools just in uh, our district that want us to come do Common Core State Standards Workshop. So that's going to be a really big, big focus. We do brown bags. We're going to be doing those brown bags with businesses for their parents during their lunch hour because we know that not every parent can come to the school. We're reaching out to a lot of our churches in our, uh, in our district, working with them and community leaders. So we, we've got a lot to go, a lot to do. Great. That's fantastic. And Emily? Uh, I think the biggest thing, and Anna said it, is the family events. Um, I think that's where, first of all, you can gather more people for the PTA. Um, but it's also, the, I think, the thing that the kids look forward to the most yeah. are those activities. And just one, for example, we started last year was a taco night right around Cinco de Mayo. <laughs> it was on the 4th, so it was Cuatro de Mayo, and <laughs> unofficially, and we had the greatest time with it and it was a free event for the school and with the um, economy and the budget cuts and all the that it was just one of those little things that we could give back to the families and to give back to the school and continuing with doing those that's fantastic to hear well these have all been incredible stories again you can read them if there were things you missed or things you wanted to circle back whitehouse.gov slash champions We'll have everybody's stories on them, take notes, duplicate, and I know Kyle will make sure everyone knows how to, how to find them. But just one more giant round of applause for all of our champions. You guys are incredible. All right, we good? Thank you guys so much. All right, thank you guys. So uh, I just want to close out the day <clears throat> with a couple things. First off, um, just so you all know, uh, the entire day uh, that you saw, either if you were watching online or for those, those are our folks here today in person, uh, there's going to be a YouTube video of the whole day, so you'll be able to watch that when you go home and share that with friends and family. As Hallie mentioned, uh, whitehouse.gov slash champions is going to have all this information up and the information on all of our incredible champions. But I'm going to uh, leave today and close out today with an ask for each and every one of you here and for all of those watching online. Uh, we need your help. We need your help to tell the story. Uh, we need you to tweet about it. Keep tweeting about it uh, with hashtag WHPTA. We need you to blog about it. We need you to write about it. We need you to grab two, two or three or ten folks at the grocery store when you get home and tell the story about your day at the White House. Tell them about the Champions of Change. And there are three reasons that I ask you all to do this. Uh, I'm sure each of you heard an idea today that you hadn't heard before. And the best way that ideas spread is through the networks, the families, the communities that all of you in here today are a part of. Uh, and the second reason is you heard a lot of examples of how this administration uh, is trying to work with all of you, the things we're trying to do in the education space and things we have done. And there's a budget debate going on in this country. And you all heard a lot about it today. Um, and your voices are the most important in this conversation. And the only way we're going to win this, win this debate and, win, and make sure that education funding is a priority moving forward is if you all make this conversation as local as you possibly can. If you tell folks what this means for your school, what this means for your community, and you guys really have a, a huge opportunity to do that coming out of here today. And the third reason is pretty simple. No matter what end of the partisan line you fall on, I think we can all agree that we need more people around the country to know that they can be change makers in their communities, to know that they can make a difference. And if you all tell the stories about your day at the White House, about the change that you're making on a daily basis, about our incredible champions of change, there's going to be more folks around the country who know that they can make a difference if they get involved with their schools, with their communities, with their, with their families and their friends. So those are my asks. Uh, that concludes our live stream uh, for today. Really incredible to have you all here today. Thank you so much to Betsy. Thank you so much to all of our champions of change. Let's give them one more round of applause.